Today is August 21st, 2014. My name is Jerry Jacobson. I'm interviewing Peg Brown, who lives in Longmont, Colorado. We're doing the interview in the basement of her home, which uh, was flooded during this September 2013 uh, flood of the St. Vrain. The interview is being recorded for the Maria Rogers Oral History Program. It's being filmed by Don Dick, who's videographer. Well, let's begin at the beginning. When and where were you born? Okay, I was born in Hastings, Nebraska. I'm not going to say the year. And I grew up in the Midwest. But I moved to uh, Colorado from Maine, where I lived for 30 years, um, two years ago. So it was a year, just about a year, um, that I lived in Colorado when the flood came. <sighs> and um, so my reasons for moving here were that I have a daughter and a son, and a little granddaughter. Um, my daughter lives on, in Long Mountain, my son lives in Denver. And also I wanted to come back to my home, back to the west, mm -hmm. um, where I felt very uh, comfortable and I love the mountains. So I arrived in August of 2013. I uh, found a little state with my daughter for a while. I was single at the time. I found a, a place to rent in Prospect neighborhood of Longmount. And on uh, January 1st, I first met Bill, who is now my partner, um, hiking together um, in Longmount. And um, on Valentine's Day, he asked me out on our first date. Um, he was widowed. His wife had died six months earlier. So that's kind of a very quick background. Sure. Um, and I was used to Maine um, of it raining for, you know, weeks on end, nor'easters and so on. Um, and um, so when I was, uh, I just got used to the dry conditions in, in Colorado. Um, on August 7th, I moved all of my home house goods that had been in storage for over a year into Bill's house. And uh, much of it came downstairs to where we're interviewing right now in our basement, which was fully furnished. And um, so both bedrooms and the living room, um, I had a lot of um, antiques, some of family antiques. I had um, all my winter clothes uh, stored in the basement. Bill had a lot of fine antiques down here too. And between the two of us, we seemed to have three of everything. So we have a very large storage area in the basement, and we had, you know, all of our extra two of everything stored in the basement. Um, so the between when I moved in and the flood, I spent a lot of time organizing things, getting linens, you know, where we wanted them to be, and that kind of thing. There and wasn't we a great there wasn't a great deal of time between the time you moved in. No, and the there flood. wasn't. That's true. Um, and um, let's see. So. Uh, we were also drywalling our garage, so about two weeks before the flood, we moved all of our bicycles, some of our tools down to the basement. Um, and uh, fortunately, we'd moved our study. We have a shared office space upstairs. Um, but we had desk and computer down here. We had television sets, um, that kind of thing. Um, over a thousand of my photographs were down in the basement, along with Bill, most of the photographs of Bill and his wife Pam and their life together. So um, the day, I can remember the day before the flood, I took a walk and I walked along Airport Road and I crossed over the St. Green River and I looked down and I saw this beautiful blue heron feeding beside and the water was flowing about what it does in the springtime and spring runoff. I didn't think much about that. I thought that looks pretty good and there's nothing to worry about. And it started to rain and I came home and the next morning, I had an appointment at 10 o'clock in Boulder. So I pulled out of the house on Airport Road about 9.30, and there was water um, flooding Airport Road near the St. Fran River. So I thought, oh. So I turned around, went down Hover, and then went on 119. I had my appointment, and um, then I made my way over to Broadway and Alpine, where my doctor's office is, Dr. Brubaker, because I needed to pick up something. And um, everything's very quiet, and I'm thinking, nobody's out on the roads. I have obviously hadn't been listening to any of the weather reports, and nobody was in the office. So then I decided, well, I'm going, for some reason, I'm going to go up Broadway and go out 36 to go home. Well, I got about um, Broadway and um, 
probably ISIS, you know, and water was pouring down Broadway, just pouring down. Mm. And I turned, I have a little Mini Cooper, which is very low to the ground. So I turned around just in time, not to get flooded, and um, went into like um, 11th Avenue and started going down 11th, trying to get back or um, to near, um, you know, Pearl and 119 again. And my car almost got swamped because water was coming down both sides of the streets. And neighbors were out looking, you know, and pulling their kids in off the streets and so on. And water, um, you know, as you, as you approach the intersections, there's always dips in the roads. So water was running around these dips, and they were about this deep. So I felt lucky, actually, to get out of Boulder. And driving home on 119, there was water, you know, um, low-lying water all along both sides of the road. So I pick up my little granddaughter. Um, my daughter lives on North 65th Street which is south of town in Longmount. And I was trying, I tried to get on uh, St. Vrain Street to pull on the airport, and again it was flooded. And just in time I decided to turn around and not try to drive my car through it uh, when I watched a, a vehicle get stalled. Um, so this is about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm on Nelson, still trying to get home. And um, was there a sense of, of danger at this point? I had, I began to be a little alarmed when I had to turn around an airport. And I suddenly realized that I was in danger of having my car swamped. But it takes, it, it takes um, time for that to sort of build up. And I, had, I wasn't at that point yet. Then Bill calls me and says, um, we've been evacuated. Our neighborhood has been evacuated. And it was complete disbelief. Now Bill's story is that he went to work. Um, he came home about 11 o'clock. Um, we think about 11.30, the landline um, died. The telephone lines were out and the electricity, but he wasn't aware of that. <clears throat> he was out in the garage cleaning up. The drywall man was finishing. And Bill's out there working away. He's not in the house. And um, a little before 2 o'clock, about 2 o'clock, a neighbor uh, named Fran who always wears an oxygen pack on her back, knocked on the door and said, you need to evacuate immediately. The St. Vrain has breached. And um, so Bill ran downstairs to see if any water was coming in the basement here, and it wasn't. Um, he ran upstairs. He checked on our neighbor next door, um, Gordon, and, Gordon Kennedy and his wife, and they're in their 80s. And he saw Gordon out in front with what he thought was a neighbor with the garage door open, so he thought, well, he's okay. And then he conferred with our neighbor over here, who said that they decided not to evacuate. So Bill went around to the back and took a look. We have a fence that runs along the back of our property. And water was spewing out of two places on either side of our home, about three feet in the air from under the fence. There's enough pressure. So he decided, OK, it's time to evacuate. So he grabs his um, CU hat, and he locks the front door, and he leaves. And as he's leaving, the water is starting to rise on the, in the street. Um, and um, he, as he's driving by his neighbor, he sees Gordon, he thinks he's OK. So he just makes it out, really. Um, and he did. He had about a five-minute window. And our neighbors who stayed said um, what happened was the St. Brain River, um, the breach, it, there's a railroad track bordering the property to the east. And the water came barreling down the railroad track and hit this neighborhood with real force. Mm -hmm. And it hit, it came between our two houses with great force and blew out um, uh, both the, the window wells. We have one window well on that side and our neighbors both of them. And it made this huge crack sound. It smashed the glass, completely smashed the steel. And uh, four feet of water flooded into our guest bedroom where the door was shut. And it, I think because the door was shut, the water didn't have anywhere to go. It blew a knocked hole through the drywall into the main living area. Um, and I think probably fairly immediately filled up with seven and a half feet of water. Now, eight feet um, is where you start having the floorboards for the top of the first floor. So, um, so Bill was very fortunate. Um, it's really quite remarkable that no one in our neighborhood was killed or hurt. Because I think if you'd been in this basement with that kind of force of water, it would have been very dangerous. Um, so um, Bill and I um, drove over to my daughter's house and said, here we are. We can't go home. 
And um, so we, we realized that we we're going to have to spend the night. You know, maybe in the next day we could go in. So my little granddaughter, who was six, wrote us this little note here. And it says, welcome. And she was just learning to spell. I don't know if you can see that. It's W-O-C-K-M. Pretty good phonetically. <laughs> and um, she then had um, school. Was out, was, out, was out for like over a week. So the next day, um, we decided, well, well, we'll try to get as close as we can. Maybe we can get into our house. Because we had no clothes, no toothbrush, no medications or anything like that. And um, we tried, um, from Hoover, we tried to get to come down 9th Avenue. And there was a policeman, there was a city policeman, and he said, well, we explained that it was our neighborhood down there. He said, well, you can drive down you know, another block. So we drove down the hill a little ways parked the car, we didn't let Chloe get out, and we looked down the hill, and the Twin Peaks golf course was a field of water. Mm -hmm. the, the Ninth Avenue was, was buried in water, and we could look out on our neighborhood, and that's when we knew that we weren't going to get by scot-free. We knew because it was underwater. Um, so um, that day then we, we went back, and um, you know, we tried to decide well, what to do. Um, and we got on to the city of Longmont had an emergency website, which was very helpful. And they were giving us uh, up-to-date information. So the next morning then, um, we found out that if you were a resident, they would allow you to come in for one hour. So we were allowed, we drove through a National Guard, um, you know, uh, Hummer you know, was guarding our neighborhood. And we came in and we parked, and the outside of our house looked pristine. The flowers, everything. You would never have known that there was a flood. It was very odd. We came in the first floor, everything looked fine. And then we looked down our, our basement stairwell, and we could see the kind of angry, ugly mark of the high water line, um, you know, brown scum. And it was within about this, about a foot from our first, first floor, wood floors on our first floor. And we looked down, and we could see about three feet of water, mud and water. And I had an old, one of my father's old uh, library bookcases with my books. And it and the books were floating on top of the water. So that's when we knew, OK, this is not good. Um, we're going to have to, we're gonna, we've lost a lot. But we had to leave again. So we turned on, I think, no, there was no electricity. Um, so we go home, and that's when you know Bill goes online to FEMA, and we start making applications for FEMA. We call our insurance companies. Uh, Bill had excellent insurance. I had household insurance, um, and their responses were both, uh, "Was it a flood? Oh, oh, you don't, you know, you have no coverage for flood insurance." So um, then we know, you know, that was bad news. Um, and on um, Sunday morning, we went to Home Depot and we bought. Um, a sunk pump, and, uh, and we invested in gloves and rubber gloves and all that kind of thing. And my daughter that weekend had to be gone, and she was taking care of two of her friend's collies who were in the garage. She has two dogs of her own, a horse and a pony. So I was taking care of all these animals, and of course it was continuing to rain. And I went out into the pasture to, uh, to feed the horses, and the pony was lying down, and I couldn't get the pony up. And then I noticed that the hay I was giving them had a little bit of mildew or something on it. So I was really concerned that it had eaten this mildewed hay and was sick. So I called my daughter and she says, well, you have to go, you have to get the vet. And our friends Ed and Leslie had come over to the house with food for us, um, so kind of them. So I was out there in this rain hitching up one uh, horse and the vet was trying to give this pony a shot, and the mud was this deep. You could, I almost lost my footing in this mud. And, um, you know, that was kind of, for people who own animals and so on, it was very hard on livestock. It was hard on people who were caring for them. Now, it had been raining the, the entire time that you've been yes, describing. Yes, it had been raining, sometimes harder than others. On Sunday, we kept hoping it would stop raining because we knew they wouldn't let us back in because they were afraid of additional breaches. So um, on Monday, we actually made um, an online application to FEMA. 
We had no idea what to expect. We'd heard about what had happened in Hurricane uh, Sandy, and, and I mean, not Hurricane Sandy, but down in New Orleans, and so we, were, we weren't sure. Um, and on Monday, um, the word came out that, well, you're allowed to come back into your homes now. If you could show proof of your ID uh, and your address, then you could allow it back in. So my daughter and Bill uh, my, um, came over. Um, Bill was trying to protect me. Cause I, and my daughter was too. I think they know that I don't handle stress really well. And so um, my daughter bought uh, boots, that you know, fishermen's boots. And uh, we had a face mask and so on. And they came downstairs for the first time. And my daughter shot the pictures that I have on my computer of the devastation. Um, everything was covered with, you know, uh, mud. It wasn't just mud. It was like clay mixed with oil, contaminants, um, smelly, um, and very difficult to clean off. So Carla was with Bill, and the first thing that Bill Dill did, bless him, was I had an old Chinese, antique Chinese cabinet that I valued, and he, um, they made, they, between the two of them, they managed to lift that upstairs. Um, and then Bill uh, rescued my photographs, um, which were, um, you know, just in, everything that was in cardboard, the cardboard imploded. So the cardboard was part of the mess. Um, and they started taking up furniture and putting it in the garage. Um, and uh, so they, when they came home that night, um, they were exhausted, covered in filth and mud. My daughter brought a guitar that was float, had been floating in the water and this pillow that I'm actually resting my back on, which had also floated. And I could tell by their faces um, how difficult it was. Um, and Carla told me, you know, how Bill had rescued the photographs, and she brought the photographs back, some old quilts and so on. You had to wash things about four times to get the dirt out. Um, and you had to use, uh, you know, high energy, I mean, a long, prolonged wash cycle and so mm -hmm. on. So I, I immediately started working on photographs. And of course, those photographs that are in albums, um, you had to cut the plastic. And then you had to clean them and then dry them um, and be careful and to then turn them over in the back, you know, when they would have to, right, so they wouldn't curl. And um, so we set up kind of emergency center in her little uh, sunroom. And uh, we had blankets on the floor and so on. I had photographs all over the place. Um, and the second day, um, our dear drywaller friend, Chuck Pola, and his son Mike, who is 15, they came over and helped Carla, and they, again, they moved stuff upstairs, and a regular hose didn't really wash the mud off. You had to do it like three times, and it still wouldn't wash it off. And so finally we borrowed um, a neighbor's power washer so we could wash the mud off of things. And I was working at home um, trying to take care of Chloe and clean photographs. Um, and... Um, it sounds like those photographs were very high priority. They were very high priority for me. And I had worked for 30 years, and I hadn't had lots of time to organize them. That was going to be a retirement project. Oh, I also retired when I moved out here. <laughs> so, um, and uh, I also had, um, and Bill brought a, a box, what had been a box, of um, his wife's jewelry, which he had kept in the basement. So very carefully, we cleaned off all this jewelry, and there was one piece that meant a lot to him that we couldn't find, but we finally found it and cleaned that all off. Um, and by Wednesday, um, Bill said he didn't want my daughter down there anymore. She's very strong, um, capable, uh, quite a hero, uh, hero and he, uh, as, as was Bill. Um, so I said, you know, Tuesday, I said, Bill, we're really going to have to call some of our friends who really need help because we had a kitchen down here and we had lots of chinaware and so on. And uh, um, on Monday, Bill had talked to our neighbor and we'd hired a firm uh, called Service Pro. And they do really, uh, they go around um, where there are disasters, flood disasters, and they remediate um, areas that have been flood damaged. So um, Bill hired a uh, service pro on Monday. He also ordered a new furnace and an air conditioner, which was about $30,000 in one day that he was putting down. Mm. Um, but um, so we know that service pro is going to come in like Thursday afternoon, and so we had until then to clean out what we wanted. 
So Bill called his friends and um, overcame Sheila. And Bill from Boulder and Kathy from Boulder and um, Roger and uh, Norma, these were friends who I didn't know very well yet. Um, and they came over and they helped uh, bring up all of the china, you know, silverware and that kind of stuff. And then they each took some of it home to clean it. And they said, you know, boy, I would clean this and then clean it again and then I'd clean it again. And that was the, that was the nature of the kind of mud that, um, that we had. My daughter was bringing up things like my family silver. Um, you know, been in general, you know, over 150 years old and it had been sitting in water. And I had a friend take some of it and refurbish it and wonderful things like that, that the kind of care that needed to be done. And, and I think the, I knew the photographs were very delicate and they were a priority for me. So my, um, my daughter was born in 1972. So, um, and all the pictures of my children when they were young were on slides. And I hadn't looked at these slides in years and they dated from like 1970 to 1980. So it was Wednesday evening, and um, about eight o'clock, and I, I had finally got around to looking at the slides, and I could see that they were starting, they were packed in boxes, but they were starting to deteriorate around the edges of the slides. So I'm in the emotional state where I start crying, you know, oh, the pictures of my babies, <laughs> they're gone. I mean, I was truly, I was truly heartbroken. So my daughter went online, and Mike's camera had put up a lot of um, suggestions for about how to save photos. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a very clear description of how to save slides. And you had to put them in a, two water baths and then hang them up individually so they could dry without touching each other. So at 8 o'clock at night, we started working on 300 slides. And we had to take, and they were stinking by this point, of course, and we had to take off the, um, I took off the cardboard siding, and then we would, we would put them in, um, in the water bath, and then put them in the next water bath. And of course, as I'm doing it, I go, oh, there you are when you're six months old, and oh, you're so cute. And um, I mean, it's my, my life, you know, what I value most, um, my family and my children. And I didn't have many um, photos other than those slides. So <clears throat> at about 11.30 at night, um, and we were hanging, my daughter took string and hung it across, zigzagged it across her sunroom. So we had all these slides hung up by paper clips, and it was working. And about 11.30 at night, we run, there, the paper clips are gone, and we have another 100 slides to do. So I say, okay, at our office back at the house, we have more paper clips, I'm going to go get them. So I drive out my little Mini Cooper, and it's a beautiful fall night. You know, it would have been beautiful, except for the flood. And I drive over an airport, and there is a big Hummer, and these, um, these two guys um, who greet me and say, hello, ma'am, you know, you're not, you're not allowed to go in. And I uh, said, well, I'm a resident, and I need to get something. <laughs> and they said, well, do you have some ID? And I didn't have, I hadn't lived here long enough to have, like, a driver's license with my current address. I had nothing with my current address. So I start to cry. <laughs> And I say, I say, my, we're, I'm trying to rescue my ch pictures of my children when they're little, and if I don't go home and get paper clips, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and one of the men take a look at my face, and he says, "Ma'am," he says, "drive on through." <laughs> so I go home, and of course we have the fans running, um, you know, night and day. And I go in and I get every paper clip in the house. And on the way back, I, I stop and I say, you guys are really great, you know, thank you so much for letting me in. And they, and they, and they tell me they're both from Colorado and so on. <clears throat> so we drive home and we continue our work and about three in the morning we're finished. And we had two paper clips left. <laughs> and by golly, we saved probably around 280 um, photos. Some were damaged around the edges, but I took them all to Mike's and they put them uh, it's one way to get all your photos digitalized. It's a rather hard way, and I wouldn't recommend it. But what a joy to me um, to have those pictures. So there are um, lots of heroes in, in our story, uh, and certainly my partner Bill is a hero because um, he was so steady and thoughtful um, and um, gentle. And, um, but the last day, it was Thursday, and I finally came over 
And uh, my first reaction on entering the house was not good. I, uh, I'm not sure what happened, but I started like just screaming at the top of my lungs. And I screamed for quite a while. And finally, I got it out of my system. And a neighbor came running over and said, are you okay? And I said, Bill said, yeah, she was just getting it out of her system. Um, but for many days after that, I had sort of a post-traumatic stress reaction when I would drive toward our neighborhood. I would start um, breathing heavily and I really, I really didn't want to come. I didn't want to be here. So I was not handling the situation really well. When you, when you walked in and found yourself screaming, what was it you were seeing? Well, it was the, our neighborhood looked like a war zone. It was, um, each neighbor had huge piles of um, debris. Um, you know, there were all kinds of machinery, and backhoes, uh, you could barely drive through. Um, and it really did, there were helicopters flying overhead, there were city and state people, um, and it really looked like a war zone. And um, it was hard for me to manage. Um, and um, so Bill, who was so steady, um, was my real, uh, real hero. And my daughter, who was um, so strong and steady too, was a hero. And my son, um, that very weekend, was in an automobile, no, I mean, I mean a uh, motorcycle accident. He had a crash motorcycle, so he couldn't help. So he wasn't um, able to help me. Sorry, you moved the mic. Oh, I know I keep touching it, so that's it. Okay. All right. So we're talking about my son who what was in an accident and was not able to help. And they actually kept that from me because they didn't want to um, excite me anymore. So about a week after the, um, the flood, I went to the doctor because I was having trouble sleeping. And I knew that I was acting very um, anxious. And so he took a look at me and he said, well, you have a little post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome here. Um, and um, so it took me a while to recover, um, quicker than I thought. Um, and I was very fortunate we had, um, uh, every day there were people here who served food at lunchtime and uh, nourishing food. And then there were neighbors that would come around and offer candy, and there were families that would come around and offer to help. There were all the churches in town, you know, uh, were there. Um, that one day, uh, uh, like six young Mormons knocked on the door and said, can we help you? And I said, would you like to clean off a whole bunch of tools out and back? And so they did that. Um, Red Cross was right there. FEMA came the third day after we made the application. They came, they interviewed Bill, they came down and took photos. And two days later, they direct deposited into, our che into Bill's checking account about $7,000. And then the remarkable thing was about a week later, we got a call from FEMA and they said, we've noticed um, we were reviewing applications from your neighbors and all of them seem to have lost their furnaces. Um, it says here that you still had your furnace. Is that true? And Bill said, no, I had to buy a new furnace and an air conditioner. So they said, well, in that case, you're entitled to more. So they, they um, direct wired another $7,000 into, uh, um, into his account. So I think they were excellent, really. They were. Um, and the city of Longmont was excellent. Um, they um, did constant cleanup. Um, they had dump trucks and so on coming through for months afterwards, actually. Or if you called them, they would come and pick things up. So um, they, were, they communicated well with us. Um, you so had not I, thought of yourselves as living in a flood, a not at all. floodplain area. No, you? that's true. Uh, we were not designated as a floodplain area, so most neighbors did not have flood insurance. And I think that will probably change. And I actually know that over millenniums, um, I know this has been a floodplain because the rocks and so on that are embedded are really smooth floodplain rocks. Um, and so probably if we hadn't had the breach, we might not have been flooded. But it's a low-lying area, um, and I'm sure the, probably the, the Utes and the Arapahoes who used to be here probably could have told us that it was a floodplain. <laughs> um, financially, um, I think Bill uh, lost about $77,000, um, both in infrastructure as well as furnishings. I lost about $20,000 in furnishings. Um, so actually, Bill was planning to retire last fall, and so he just worked another year 
sort of make that up again. Um, and um, but I think it was the um, the toll on us physically and emotionally was the the physical labor of moving things up and cleaning them off. Um, we just we soon discovered like we would move a lot of the wood furniture up, but you know a week later it was cracking and dissolving, sort of not dissolving but disintegrating in front of us. So we just heaped you know, all my antiques and bills right on top of the pile. Um, and um, I remember there was one day when I had all my children, I'd saved my children's um, pictures that they'd drawn, you know, on Valentine's and all of those things. And uh, there they were in this, they were in a file and they were just covered with mud and caked. So I was lying them out on the grass, you know, trying to save them. What do I do? And my neighbor across the street, who I didn't know very well, Rose Marie, comes over and I said, how do you save paper? So she told me how to do it. And you, you blot it between paper towels and then you dry it. And um, so I managed to save all their school records. And, and uh, for Christmas last year, I gave them both books of those saved things. Uh, I think those were most precious to me. Um, and uh, about, we stayed at my daughter's for 15 days, bless her heart. And um, then we came back and we had, uh, we always had running cold water. But by that time we had warm water and we had our furnace in because it was starting to get cold. Um, and we, um, Service Pro did an excellent job. It took them four days to clean out this basement and they opened up both the window wells and just hauled stuff up. And, uh, you know, Lego pieces, puzzle pieces, all the paraphernalia of your life, and there are little trails across the lawn, glass, which I was, st I'm still picking up glass from the lawn. Mm -hmm. And the carpet, they had, they cut it, first they sucked the water out of it, mud, and then they cut it into three foot pieces so that they could drag it up because it was so heavy. And there must have been like nine people working down here every day, and they would come upstairs exhausted, just exhausted at the end of every day. So we really appreciated their labor. Um, has, has there been a point at which you began to feel comfortable in your home again? As thank that you for that you? question. Um, uh, first couple of weeks I didn't, um, and I really wanted to be living elsewhere. And then there was a point um, where um, I was sleeping better and um, eating better. And um, and so I I said okay you know we're back now and the upstairs feels normal, um, and um, we had everything down to the studs down here, but I remember Bill and I in the middle of October, we decided well we really need to get away because we were still scrubbing daily, just out outside stuff you know. Um, uh, everything from bicycles to dolls, just scrubbing. We actually scrubbed for like through December. But um, so we decided we'd go up to Brainerd Lake. And uh, we had to go 93 all the way, I think, to Route 6. And it took us an hour and a half or whatever to get up to Brainerd. And I remember looking at Bill and he was, he was so exhausted. And I hadn't really appreciated how how exhausted he was. He didn't have any emotional or physical energy um, for what normally we would enjoy tremendously. And I, and I realized um, what a toll it had taken on him too um, in his quiet, steadfast way, but, um, but just as exhaustion. Um, and so it took, I think it probably took him through Christmas for us to feel like we were rested um, and that we weren't thinking about flood details quite as much. Now in January we started, um, you know, redoing and putting drywall and, and um, picking carpet and things like that. And at first, um, my first reaction was I don't have the energy to do this, but I gained my energy back. And um, through my friends and support of my friends, I, I, um, and I realized that I needed to be a good uh, support and companion for Bill to do that. So, um, so what have I learned? I've learned lots of lessons. Um, and the first thing I, I think I learned is uh, um, that even if I'm not resilient, um, I'm very fortunate to be around people who will support me. Um, and that's a really wonderful thing to know. As I said, I have lots of heroes. Um, 
And I've developed an increased appreciation for the city of Longmont and my community. Um, people really came together, even those not affected by the flood felt um, very, um, uh, felt a lot of compassion for those of us who were affected and, um, and would express that to us. Um, I did find, I had a few people and say, um, well, you weren't affected very much. You didn't have to leave your home. And um, I did talk to one counselor and she said, well, you know, you had loss. And, um, and I did lose a lot of material things. She said, so you have to honor that. And so I would say to people, no, that's not the case. I did express, I did have loss. And um, it was difficult. So I think that's probably one of the reasons I wanted to be interviewed is because I have done some interviewing of very resilient people who, um, who were able to deal a little better than I was at first. So I thought, well, I'll be honest and say no. Um, but um, I think, um, the city of Long Mountain made the permitting, they, they cut a lot of the red tape with the permitting processes. Um, as late as November, they were still picking up trash, um, and they were very, uh, very, very helpful. And then I made new friends. I didn't know too many people in this neighborhood. And so now I'm very good friends with my neighbor across the street and the neighbor next door. Um, and the friendships that I did have, I deepened those friendships. Um, I certainly deep, Bill and I figured that if we needed, um, having gone through this experience together, it was like trial by fire or trial by water, <laughs> and it made us stronger as a couple, um, and um, that's a real joy. You, you've made plain that there was plenty of loss involved in this, but you say also that some things were gained. I did. I gained, um, and, I, um, and I began to understand um, uh, that I, I have resilience, um, and that um, you know everybody heals. Healing takes time, um, and that also you have to have a little compassion for your own nervous system and your how you react to things. And I have a great compassion now when I hear of other disasters in other areas. Um, and I can remember when I went into the FEMA headquarters, I went in to ask if I w was uh, if I could get any assistance for my household goods, and the answer was no. But but they could tell that I was a little traumatized, and and you know and they explained to me that um, they were used to seeing people daily who were not coping as well as they might have. It's just you can't deal with details. You uh, you're sort of in a fog for a while. You know when you enumerated the heroes in this episode, you you omitted yourself. What I think of the Battle of the Paper Clips and <laughs> and, uh, and, and how to preserve paper, you know, children's <laughs> paper for the past. Uh, that's impressive. Well, thank you. I, I think my daughter was a true hero on there because I don't think I could have um, done it by myself. So I'm going to I'm going to um, say that she's the hero on that. <clears throat> my little granddaughter was a um, was a, a little bit of a hero too. Um, and I realized one day we were passing the St. Frame River, and she said, "Nana, is it going to happen again?" And I realized that she had no idea about closure. Um, and I said, "No, it's not going to have a flood again." Good question that all of us ask occasionally, <laughs> and um, but um, <clears throat> so you know I was able to I wanted to protect her and reassure her, um, which I think that we did a pretty good job of. And I always said you know that things weren't important to me, but I actually lied because I moved a lot of things from the East Coast here, even though I did get rid of a lot, and things <clears throat> that I had inherited and so on really were important to me, but I also learned that. They're not critically important, um, and that um, I think memories and um, love that you've shared you know, will carry you through. Um, you know, certain things remind you of things that you've loved, um, but um, but I find that I have that in my head. Like I lost a couple pictures of my children that were taken. You know, like um, Olin Mills kind of pictures that you couldn't replace. But I can see that picture. I have their little dear little faces in front of me. I don't need the actual thing. Um, always keep your pictures and your genealogies on high ground. I did have the work that my parents had done on genealogy in the first floor, which I was very grateful for. Um, ask for help when you really need it, because people um, want to help you, um, you know, and then you can repay that um, when you can help others. So. Um, and it's okay to, uh, to ask friends and your community for help. It gives you uh, 
it was very hard for Bill to do that. You know, he's, he's a man, and he's not supposed to ask for help. But I think he learned that lesson, too. And um, I would say, don't collect things for posterity. Um, collect memories. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thank you so much for sharing your experience with this. I think it will be of interest and, and uh, it will be helpful to people in, who face traumas of this or other kinds, too, in the future. Well, thank you very much. I would like to say that we have like 90 homes in the Champion Greens neighborhood, and all but about three um, lost their basements and so on. One man had his, uh, he was a photographer, and he had all of his, uh, all of his business in the, in the basement, and he lost that. And um, so we have, and many of the people in here are older, so that means, you know, they have retirement savings, but, um, but they're a very resilient group. So thank you, it was a real, uh, I really appreciate your interviewing me. Thank you, that was, a, that was fun to do.